Well, thank you so much for coming on a Sunday morning, rainy Sunday morning. And so we are a small audience, but it's what I call an intimate audience. So I will begin with Saris. And uh, she has written this incredible collection of short stories. And I read two of them last night. And the whole night, the images was they were churning in my mind. They're so powerful. And they're so crafted in such a simple way. You know, there's not. So tell me, how do you manage to do a powerful story, yet keep the language simple? I can't do difficult stuff. <laughs> I mean, or intellectual stuff, you know, I just write very simply and I think that is the thing. Mm. I didn't know how to write it <laughs> very grandly or grandiosely. I just wrote. Well, that's, that's your power, uh, you know, to be able to write you. simply and thank get you. these very, very disturbing stories, especially the one that you're going to read from. Would you like to begin uh, with reading or you want to just talk about the We can talk craft? about it. Okay, so, yeah. fine. Thank you. Mm. So, how would you like to tell me, how do you start? When we were talking on email, she said, please don't ask me how I get my ideas. I hate <laughs> that. But I am going to ask her that. How do you get your ideas? Um, it, that's a hard question. Growing up, you listen to stories. You, 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 you visit with your mom. You visit people. And, and women talk. When they come to your house to visit, they talk. Uh, you open the newspaper and you see things. These, these images, these stories trigger off something in your mind. For example, um, strong, powerful women like, you know the, the main story, Patu, uh, who defied the community and always had to pay the price for it. We knew women like that. We grew up with women like that. And I thought they needed to be heard. Except that when I was growing up, I thought they were awful women. Dreadful women, you know, because we, I grew up in a very conservative home. It was only when I started writing the stories, it's only when I started writing Patu's story, um, and when I started writing it, she, I, I was determined to punish her. You know, she was an abusive mother, she hit her child, she was mean to her child, she was mean to everybody, she destroyed so many lives, but, and I wanted to punish her. The story refused to work mm. when I tried to do it that way. And, and so it took so many uh, gazillion drafts, and I had to, in the meantime, grow up. Arifa, your book is very intensely packed in one day. And how did you manage that? Because that's quite a feat, you know, to have this. It's a murder mystery. I won't give the ending away. And it's <laughs> very intense. And it's just all happens in one day. Uh, yeah. Hi. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for coming on this. Uh, it actually rained on our parade, right? <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> It's still and a marathon. <laughs> Apparently, there's a marathon work. outside. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, all my other books, Bulbul, uh, have been, most of them have been on nature and environment. Uh, uh, I grew up in a family of naturalists and wildlifers, and some of the earliest big game hunters turned conservationists of India. So, when I started writing, when I was growing up, my father would take me to the forests. And inside the cages of leopards and bears and crocodiles and pythons. Snakes. 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 <laughs> yeah, I grew up with yeah, snakes. snakes. So, so that I lose all fear of animals. And I did to a great extent. So when I started writing, the setting came naturally to me. I felt very strongly about environment and nature and conservation. And to see the kind of destruction, the wildlife and nature destruction that is happening around us. It really moved me. And also my father always told me that to connect children with nature, it should not be through uh, preaching and teaching, yeah. it should be through stories. Yeah. Uh, 
so that is how i started writing that and uh, i would rather as i was telling in my talk day before also that i would rather that the children know the names of animals and birds and insects rather than celebrities and cars and brands so i i of course started writing for children on nature uh, and at some point of time of course when you you when you write about in a, in a particular space mm -hmm. Uh, your publishers want you to keep on writing in that space. The readers want you to keep on writing in that because it is for publishers, it is easier to sell. Yeah. And for readers, of course, you know, it's basically branding. Branding, yeah, you've branded. Yeah. yeah, so if you want to write something completely different, which is, which is in a completely different space, some authors, what they do, like J.K. Rowling, yeah, is yeah, that yeah. they take a pen name. Yeah like Robert Galbraith. She yeah. started writing when she started writing the detective yeah. novels. But again, you have authors like Stephen King, who is a well-known mm. horror uh, author, author of horror genre. He has written books like Shawshank Redemption and The Green Mile. Yeah. So I think at some point of time, I would have looked in the mirror and told myself that the readers should not know what to expect from this author. <laughs> right. So that is when, That's and yeah. yeah, so even for a children. A surprise, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So startle, startle them, startle your reader. Yeah. So um, that is when I actually wrote a, a, a three books for children also, which are on completely different subjects. I wrote a book on open prisons in India for children. Mm -hmm. And I wrote another couple of books on different subjects. <coughs> and then it was during lockdown that this novel came to me. Uh, I wanted to write about... Uh, the Indian social milieu. I wanted to write about gender. I wanted to write about, uh, um, uh, you know, caste and religious equation here, everything. And I wanted to write a murder mystery as well and pack it all in a day. Yeah. So I thought, yeah. why not? Let's yeah. have some it's fun. It's a real challenge. You set yourself a real challenge. Yes, yeah, but it but was it a works. truckload of fun. But it <laughs> works because it's so tense. And you just, it's a page turn. I keep wanting to know what's going to happen. And there are a lot of characters who are, you're very sympathetic. Like the night soil worker, who's a very beautiful woman. Tell us, tell us a bit about her. That's right. So when I started writing, of course, the characters uh, are drawn from my compost heap. I generally pull out the characters from my compo internal compost heap that I have and also draw a lot from real life. And my own vulnerability, losses. Mm -hmm. Now, I I'm sure everybody in the audience and all of us, at some point of life, we would have wanted to kill somebody. <laughs> and we all have had some or the other personal loss. So. Um, not just Parijat, that character, because this is a very character-focused novel. Yeah. All the characters I drew from real-life experiences, some of them uh, are loosely inspired, like Dada Bhai, uh, who, who is one of the characters of the book. He's inspired from my grandfather, uh, who was also known as Bapu. He did a lot of work for tribal upliftment. Uh, he was an aristocrat. Uh, uh, the character of Mena Bai in the book is loosely drawn from my grandmother, yeah. who was a disabled person, and she was the initiator of women's education movement in southern Rajasthan. Uh, so, and Bari B, the the house ta uh, the, the caretaker of the house, she was actually Bari B who was the caretaker of their house. Uh, so, a lot of those characters are inspired from real life, and many of the other characters are an amalgamation of the people that yeah. I know or I've yeah. heard of or yeah. I've uh, come across. And also, I I drew a lot from Urdu poetry. Mm. So, for instance, uh, the character of Parijat, as you ask. So there is so much packed in Urdu poetry, even if you pick up one share, that sort of, you know, you can draw a character from it. So Parijat, for instance, there is this share that came to me uh, when I was writing the character. I don't remember the shire, unfortunately. Main ek katra hoon, par mera alag wajood to hai. Main ek katra hoon, par mera alag wajood to hai. Hua kare jo samandar meri talash mein hai. Or for that like instance, translated, uh, uh, translation would be yeah, a little difficult. A little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, so it is about, you know, just being uh, very confident about whoever you are. You know, you, you can be a drop in the ocean, but you have your own existence. Yeah. 
So that is what the share means. Or for instance, uh, the other character which I was writing, um, uh, who is basically the girl who gets murdered in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a 16-year-old girl. So the share that came to me was that, um, uh, uh, which was the share, uh, it was, yeah. Sune na jate the tumse mere din raat ke shikwe. Sune na jate the tumse mere din raat ke shikwe. Kafan sarkao meri be zubani dekhte jao. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's beautiful yeah. one. Yeah. Or for that matter, when mm -hmm. I was writing the character of um, uh, Suhra Bai, who's an old woman, she's a hellcat though. But uh, I, this is, you know, these were the lines that were playing in my mind that. Uh, Hamne har rang mein ye saraye fani dekhi. Saraye fani is dunya. Saraye jo khatm hoti ho. Khatm hone wali saraye. Fani means khatm hona. Hamne har rang mein ye saraye fani dekhi. Har cheez yaha ki aani jani dekhi. Jo a ke na jaye wo budha pa dekha. Jo ja ke na aaye wo jawani dekhi. Oh, wonderful. Now, Saras, tell me, I noticed in all your stories, it's first person. Ah. Do, you, do you do that all the time? Or is it something that just comes to you naturally? It just comes. I, I don't know why. Yeah. I think it's because when I write the stories, the characters don't let me do as I please. Mm. You know, um, when I try to control the narrative or control the, the journey of the story, they they play dead it, because it's it's more like because i'm the author mm. and i'm is authorial i'm the author man i i, I know how this story should go mm. how it should create yeah, yeah create and I, I and i'm the big boss and then yeah. i try to do that yeah. and i end the story <coughs> the stories just go flat mm. you know so because of that yeah. uh, because then then it takes many many draws a lot of tears and lots of frustration before i realize that the writer has to respect yeah. uh, the story and the characters. So I put myself in the story, yeah. but the I is not really me. Yeah. You know, because the, the, the moment I try to say me, it doesn't work. The, the authorial interference yeah. and ego has to be pushed aside. Mm. But I still put an I so that I can understand from inside out how characters feel. And um, the other thing I realized, but, but I, which I have to constantly realize for each story is that I'm only, only the channel, I'm only the conduit. I keep forgetting it, which is why the stories take so long to form, because they lie dead. You know, yeah. the, 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 the characters become sticks, and uh, they refuse to play ball. So yeah, I do use I, but... And are you also like Arifa, inspired by real life? People like all writers are magpies, you know, they're constantly ah, yes, stealing, yes, eavesdropping, yes. <laughs> getting little conversations. In fact, my relatives say, always say, we're not going to tell you anything because it'll appear in a book. <laughs> oh, why so, am I not appearing in your story? Yeah, right. Yeah. Why am I not? Yeah. yeah so are you also yes, inspired I, like I think we're all like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stories fascinate us. Mm. And also, uh, the newspapers. And I, what I wanted to say was that. I've written 14 stories in this. None of them were imagined. They were all lived experiences. Yeah. Not my lived experience, not, not just my experience, yeah. but lived yeah. experiences, like the police brutality, yeah. straight out of the newspapers in Malaysia. I mean, they all said in Malaysia. So police brutality, um, you know, um, abuse towards mates, straight out of the newspapers. Yeah. I didn't have to create anything new. Mm -hmm. What I did was to give them shape and a story and a perspective. But all the experiences were lived experiences, authentic experiences. Would you like to read something? Yes. Said, yeah, and after that you could read yeah. something. A little bit of background. I'm going to read a, two pages of this story called Call It By Its Name. The word killing is a racial slur against Indians in Malaysia, particularly South Indians, particularly dark Indians, all right? So uh, it's not just a racial slur, it's like something that's com commonly banded about to describe a South Indian. And, and uh, despite people knowing that it's offensive, they continue 
to describe Indians as killing. It was said, can you hear me? It was said that 200 years ago, the British shipped Indian prisoners to this country to work in chain gangs. How dark skinned, how scary those prisoners. Wherever they went, the clinking sounds of their leg irons preceded them. Clink, clink, clink. The locals called the prisoners cling. Over time, the pejorative stretched to include all dark, scary ethnic Indians. This evening, Ma'za, who is my friend, who sells the crunchiest, tastiest pisang goreng this side of Kuala Lumpur, who is the bubbliest, warmest person I know, calls me Kling. It slaps my face. I have never been called Kling before. Kling has always been other people. Ma'za sits on a stool at the back of the stall, her hands gripping a smartphone on the table. Some preacher is paddling hate on the speaker phone and he has her entire attention. I catch bits of him, reedy voice, exhorting his listeners to watch out for enemies who are planning to kill the faithful and take over the country. Out of sheer good kindness, because we are a gentle people, because we are a good people, we allowed these people into the country. We allowed them to live, to work, to prosper. But what did they do? They scorned our kindness. They took our wealth, they took our lands. And now, the threat that if that's not enough, these infidels are planning to kill us and take over the country. Ma'za utters furious curses under her breath. Surely no one believes this bilge, I think. How are you, Ma'za? I call out. And at once she jumps up as if on fire and cries to her husband, what is that cling doing here? Cling. It's, I should let it go. But I'm rooted to the spot. Too stunned to be angry. What did you call me, Ma'za? My voice is low. She looks away. Her mouth sat in a straight line, two spots of pink high on her cheeks. Cling. I'm 36, tall, slender, chocolatey brown, educated, attractive, even exotic, if you look at me from a certain angle. Cling has always been other people, other Indian Malaysians, comfortable narratives to feed the disdain of other races. Cling are the darker ones, the stupid, lazy, drunk, fighting on the road ones, the gangsters, the drug pushers, the ones from the estates, from squatter areas, from city slums, low life, smelly, dirty, filthy, black cling, all the soothing stereotypes that exist, inexorable in the minds of others, of landlords who won't rent out to Indians, in mothers who frighten their children with a black bogeyman, they exist in the hearts of ordinary, otherwise decent folk who need the cling. I do not know until Ma'za tells me that I too am cling. Beautiful. So if we continue this, I shouldn't say theme, just this thread of marginalized people, would you like to read something about Parija, sure. or whatever, whatever uh, you yeah. have decided. So read. this book... You have to read very loudly because we've got the rain. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so this book, The Witch in the People Tree, is basically, I don't know what genre it is. Uh, it is a murder mystery, but it is also a historical novel and uh, a literary novel set in 1950 Udaipur and spread over only one day of Makar Sankranti, which is the Kite Flying Festival. It is told from the perspective of an untouchable girl, a night soil worker basically, uh, a Bohra Muslim widow, a Zamindar, a Bheel tribal and a middleman. So I'll just read a bit, maybe I'll read the Rao Sahib's chapter, who's the Zamindar. It is told from these five different perspectives. And as you said, I have not written in I, 
but I also, you know, suffered a case of skipping personalities when I was writing this book. So one day I would be this uh, night soil worker carrying a bottle of feces, you know, uh, sorry, a basket of feces on her head from Dada Bhai's private toilet. The other day I would be this, you know, uh, child widow buddy be going up and down the mansion. Uh, you know, uh, with the house uh, keys dangling on my waist. Yet another day, I would be Rao Sahab, uh, the zamindar who delights in farting and, you know, who's, uh, yeah, who's traveling from his estate to Daipur, cursing the city and, you know. So, yeah, uh, I, I was, I, 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 and sometimes, you know, when I would, as I said, I would become that character. Um, and I, I, as I said, I drew from my losses as well. So I had not lost my uncle Riyas Tehseen then. I was very close to him uh, when I was growing up. And I took a lot of information from him about this book because this is a historical novel uh, set in 1950. And then as one of the other authors, Tarun Saint was saying, he reads a lot on that independence era. And he was saying that, wow, it is boring now. <laughs> so he was saying that there are no, probably no books of that era yeah. about that region. So obviously I didn't have any reference material, you know, when I was writing this book. Mm -hmm. So I, I used to speak a lot to him about it, but I had already started to lose my father then. My father is a very well-known wildlife scientist and naturalist. And he, uh, you know, there, were, there would be people from all over the world who would come to meet him every day from morning till night. He was very generous with giving information and, you know, parting with his knowledge and sharing his knowledge. So we would have people from morning till night. But after his brain stroke, he was not the same person he used to be. So I had started to lose him and I'm still losing him. And so many times I feel, you know, I really wish that I could make him whole again, but I can't. And so many days when I would stop writing, I would have tears in my eyes because, you know, this is just one instance, but I would be yeah. drawing so much from my you own. You want to connect with him, you want to share and, things yeah, with him. Yeah. Not just him, everything else that I wrote about, I would, you know, basically be that character and, you know, um, so I'll... Of course, read from uh, Rao Sahib. This is inspired by your father. No, no, no. This no. character? No, your not grandfather. at all. Your Very grandfather? Far. No, no, no. The, this okay. is not inspired from any of those people. Okay. <laughs> this is the Zamindar. Okay, uh, he's a bad guy. So not we don't really think. bad guy. So then again, yeah. So the, again, we all are, uh, I believe, more a product of our uh, surroundings and social upbringing than we are of our genes, I believe. You know, it is, uh, even when you look at the Indian social milieu, the belief system has not drastically changed from that era to this one. Uh, and, I, and I think all of us have an evil streak in us. And we are a little good, we are a little bad. All of us are a mix. So I, I really hope that, you know, uh, the readers who read this book, be it good characters or bad characters, uh, they will end up empathizing with each one of them. So, yeah, Rao Sahib, the Zamindar, Dada Bhai's house, Borwadi Udaipur. So, Dada Bhai is the character inspired from my grandfather, not Rao Sahib. The sky outside the Jharoka was shamelessly naked, a cold, bitter blue. Rao Sahib favored cloudy skies that aroused pompous peacocks and far sighted buzzards. But then, what did you expect of cities but characterless paper kites dancing to the tune of pimps? Only two kinds of people have ruled Hindustan, Dada Bhai. He lifted one of his buttocks and farted with force. He would have liked to claim it was a 12 bore he had fired, but refrained, glancing at Dada Bhai's distinguished face. Muslims and Rajputs, you and I, how will a Shudra and Brahmin rule, you tell me? Patel and Nehru? It will be a disaster. Dada Bhai smiled at his silver teaspoon, stirred the tea, clinked it on the edge of the cup and replied placing it on the saucer. It wasn't me, Rao Sahib, but our Maharana of Mewad, Bhupal Singh Ji, who was one of the first from Rajputana to join the Union of India after independence. Didn't you always say he was a visionary? Dada Bhai, 
he had visions of a free India snatching away all our fortunes, if you ask me. Rao Sahib fingered his thick, upcurving moustache. People misread it as an act of being proud. It was an act of finding relief from his overcharged state. Ah, feeling the tantalizing hair between the fingers and rolling the pointy tips was catharsis, like breaking wind. And he chose the path of minimum friction. The state of Jodhpur almost exceeded into Pakistan. Even Jaisalmer was in talks with Jinnah. He had given them a blank page to write their terms, they claim. I say, we should have fought harder for our rights or remained an independent entity, neither a part of India nor of Pakistan. The British had left the subcontinent two and a half years back, dividing it into India and Pakistan with a stroke of imperial genius. Who said independence was won? It was doled out. A sugar dripping gulab jamun split up between two tussling brats. Fools thought Jinnah and Gandhi were the fathers of Pakistan and India. It was Lord Louis Mountbatten. So that is. That's just a taster and a lot of exciting things unfolding in this one 24 hours, yeah? Is yeah. it 24, 24 hours? hours? And um, about my favorite story from yeah. your thing is the mother. Like, would my you mother, like Patu. Yeah, just a paragraph from that. Can I just tell you something about that? Yeah, if you that, tell yeah. us something about this very, very difficult relationship between a daughter and a mother. And she's dealt with it, it in a very sensitive way. And it's it's the first time I've read, after many years, a child trying to hate her mother, but failing to do so, despite being abused by the mother. So how did you deal with this? Again, it's real life. Um, it's... Um, I wanted to write about a horrible woman, as I said to you before, but I couldn't because uh, as I as I grew up myself, and I and I, you know, um, lived and loved and suffered and lost and everything. I learned that people are complicated, and it's, there's no there's no uh, good and bad as in as in very definitive terms. People are complicated. People are complex, and and I wanted to show that Patu, as much as she was uh, an abuser, was herself a victim. And, uh, and, and, and therefore, it was like that. You, that there's, it, it's different hues of colors to each person. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you have to look at it that way. One of the biggest compliments was that um, people telling me, I tried to hate her, I tried to hate her, and I couldn't. And that was nice. Or people telling me, you're writing about my mother. And this is someone from the Bronx. <laughs> you know, so yeah, so cut to, but to cut across boundaries, I think it, or, mm -hmm. Simply because I think it is just uh, authentic and real, and people are all just not always victims, not always perpetrators, but a bit of both. You want me to read the yeah, just opening? Yeah, the first opening. The opening. Opening paragraph. And like you said, this, you looked at the different points of view. So you became, one day you became this. And that's the joy of writing, being a writer, isn't it? Absolutely. It's like an actor, you can go into different roles. Yeah. Yeah, and you can act as God as well. As yeah. <laughs> Just the first paragraph. My mother, Patu, graced our lives largely with her absence, for which my father and I, and to a lesser extent, grandma, were profoundly grateful. She descended upon us once a month, to collect her allowance from grandma, loot the pantry, curse my father, and cuff me on the ear. We breathed a collective sigh of relief when she went away, except for grandma who wept in secret for the daughter she could not stand to live with. That's the first paragraph. I mean, it's a very strong, very strong paragraph. And that's the great thing about writing a short story, isn't mm -hmm. it? You have to capture your audience in that first para, and a novel 
you have, though your novel is 24 hours, so you must have had a lot of stress trying to pack everything in that. Did you feel that? Did you feel that maybe I shouldn't have made it in one day, maybe I should have extended it? Uh, no, not at all. I think I started off uh, with, you know, trying to pack it all in one day. And uh, yeah, that's what I tried to do and I completely enjoyed it because uh, these are coming from such different section of the Indian society. You know, that their stories, their backgrounds, they are very disparate. So, uh, and as I said, you know, the things have not drastically changed from that, you know, era to this one as far as our belief systems are concerned. Uh, our Indian culture, our tehzeeb, as we call it, is so disparate and at the same time highly syncretic. It is so complex that you cannot simplify it. You know, the only way to simplify it is through a story. And that is what I have tried to do through this novel. And also, uh, I think the other thing that I have tried to bring out is that I'm sure uh, even uh, Saras has tried to do that through her stories, is to show that many times, so more often than not, the oppressed is also an oppressor. Yeah, like and you, although, yeah, yeah we are all, all a victims. sum total of the choices that we make, and sometimes we are also a victim of the choices that we make. Now, just to move away a little bit from this, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your naturalist background, your childhood days, how you went out with your father in the forest. That must be very treasured memories. Yes, yes. So, um, uh, our family, it is a sort of a joint family. We all live together. We have a very green lane in Udaipur and all of us live together there. Um, so, our uh, weekly family outings would not be to a shopping mall or to a, you know, theatre to watch a movie. We would just be driving in the Aravlis. We would pack in two cars or whatever and, you know, go for long drives in the Aravlis. And every summer we spent in the forests. My grandfather, as I said, he's one of the earliest, uh, you know, conservationists of India, big game hunter, stern conservationist. He was a contemporary of Jim Corbett. They used to exchange correspondences, things like that. So yes, it was always, uh, and I have learned a lot of lessons from the wild. I'll tell you one such story. So we were visiting the forests of Kumbalgarh. Uh, uh, Kumbalgarh, I, I don't know if you have heard about Kumbalgarh Fort. So, we were Rajasthan, in, in, in Rajasthan, Rajasthan, yeah, one of the forests. So, we used to stay in a small, very basic uh, forest guest house there. And every evening, we would go to see the animals at dusk because dusk and dawn are the two best times to see animals. Uh, because most of the animals, either they are nocturnal or diurnal or they are crepuscular. So, crepuscular are the animals which are most active during um, dusk and dawn, like cats. So, and the nocturnal and diurnal animals, one are day animals, the other are night animals. And the best time to see all these kinds of animals are dawn and dusk because one kind of animal is retreating, the other is, you know, starting its day and they all need a drink. So, they come to the water holes to drink water. That is why it is the best time to see animals. And uh, uh, every evening, I am not a morning person anyway, so every evening at dusk, we would go to this particular water hole and sit a little away from it to see the animals. So, one such evening, one of my school friends was also along with me, two of my cousins, my dad was there. So, there was this water hole. Every evening, there was a sounder of 17 wild boars that would come to that particular yeah, uh, water hole to drink water. And we were sitting a little away, you know, behind some bushes. For some reason, they would have sensed some movement around the bush. And all the 17 of them, them attacked us. So my, um, my friend, Shweta, she of course, I mean, she, she was very scared and she just held my hand. And I told her, no, no, everything is all right. We had such blind faith in my father. I mean, he, if he's sitting and not running away, then everything is fine. So, and my father just raised his hand very slowly for us to be eyes still. So you had the sounder of wild boars attacking us. And at that very same time, 
there was this big cobra that actually passed by. He actually went on to the shoes of my father and he's slowly passing by. We all are sitting very still. The wild boars are attacking. And they would have reached very close to us, just a few feet away, and they stopped. So probably what happened was that the direction of the wind changed and they sensed that there were humans ahead. But they kept on standing there and making huffing and puffing noises. Uh, uh, and they were there grunting and whatever. And after a few moments, which seemed very long to us, but it couldn't have been that long, they just turned and they went away. And the cobra also went on its way. Of course, we are all snake lovers, so we went after the cobra and we were trying to, you know, see it closely. So that is the time when it raised its hood and it demonstrated a little. But then it again went down and it went on its way. So the lesson that I learned was that animals are large-hearted. How many of us will remain unmoved if there is a cobra or a wild boar in our house? Forget about our house, even our garden or our streets or our town. We will not rest in peace till the time it is captured or even killed after that. Yes. So that's, that's, that's a little bit of a side thing because she's a naturalist and I'm crazy about wildlife, so I wanted to tap into that. Asaris, what is your next book? This is one more question you didn't want me to ask, but I'm going to ask you. What are you working it's on It's very now? hard to answer because I'm a sloth, half sloth, half dinosaur. So it's coming along. Short story. I can't do novels because novels are hard. You know, your, your, your concentration, your planning and everything. I, I can't do it. Short stories are easier. So yes, they're coming along. They're slow. And, uh, and the other thing about, uh, just a little bit about writing craft is, you know, sometimes you write a story and you think it is done. Fine, it's done. You put it aside or you send it out into the world and then it constantly gets rejected and you get so upset because they don't recognize your genius. And then, yeah, because you think you're you so think good. Every word you yes. written is so precious. And then six months down the road, you pick it up again and then you realize it's rubbish. It's so so, you know, uh, pompous, or it's so smug. And then you realize, God, this is me, my authorial stuff, trying to, trying to act back. Then you put it aside, and then you start all over again. And I think I did that with many stories in this book as well. You know, so it's like, you look at it in a fresh eye, and you realize, um, damn, this story is all about me, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And then you go back and you yeah. That's the writer and the painter. Any creative person is so much about yes. me, yes. myself. Yes. That's why some of us are pretty boring. Because you're constantly, <laughs> you know, talking about yourself and what you think. But I think the actors are the worst. Uh, writers yes. are slightly <laughs> better. Than but we still that. think we're brilliant. Yeah. So that's a whole problem, yeah. So I think <laughs> we have about seven minutes. Should we go into questions now? Would would anybody like to ask? These two, yeah. Never mind. Very good morning, everyone. And it was lovely hearing you out. And um, it was really nice knowing how you worked as a writer and what did you think and where the ideas came from and everything. But I'm really curious to know um, the reader part of you, all of you. Like, what kind of stuff do you like to read when you were children? How much did you read? So, what really inspired? If you're not going to read, excuse me, you're not going to write. You know, you need to read because I feel my, I, I, I never learned how to write. So, you know, for me, I, as far as my writing is concerned, I like to inhabit a no man's land where there are no rules or regulations. And for an autodidact like me, the unwritten commandment is that there is no unwritten commandment. And my greatest teachers have been books. 
so that is how i have learned and that is why I, what i keep telling children also whatever they want to read in whichever form they want to read they should keep on reading fiction or non fiction anything there are many people now bulbul who say that you know fiction is a waste of time why are you reading fiction you know you should rather read non fiction you should be seen knowing you know things that everybody seems to know a little about so you know you should be reading non fiction but fiction is a different kind of education it is emotional education and you know our failure to empathize is what leads us to pursue cruelty you cannot remain unmoved by after reading you know about slavery it will you it will you will come out with your belief shattered in slavery after reading hakalbari finn if you have read godan by munshi premchand you will not come out unmoved by the plight of the rural india so you know reading uh, and, and fiction especially helps to uh you know change the subaltern opinions of people and i had read it somewhere i i don't again remember who had said it that non fiction can reveal the lies but only metaphor can reveal the truth mm. what did you what did you read okay uh, did you read? i read anything everything but i stop reading if if it bores me life is so short you know but what i can tell you is that When I really like a book, I read it two times at least. One for the pleasure of reading, and the second time you go back because you're a writer, you go and look at the craft. How did they get how what they got? I mean, because you are a writer and you have to learn from the greats. So that learning the craft goes the second time. First time is pleasure, and the first time if it's boring, you just throw it apart. Life is throw it away. Life is so short. but the learning the craft is important because you, there's so many different kinds of writers and different ability with different abilities and you want to know how they did what they did what they yeah that's right. important anybody else any other question by the way i must tell you that asaras lives in malaysia and she lives in sri lanka so the most exotic <laughs> please maybe your next book will be about sri lanka i think no yeah it is half based in sri lanka and half yeah, in india you know there you are yeah uh, good morning wonderful session uh, sir as you drawn so much from from news and from things happening around you and you get inspired is there a switch on and off when you are experiencing your day to day life you store away information as an author or is there a reflection point where you look back and you know tie the stories together i mean it's i find it fascinating that so many things come together what's the process i, I no i don't think it does that um there's a switch because you're a writer you're also a housewife you're also washing clothes and cooking and cleaning and 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 mopping and doing all the stuff and you're also working i'm a freelance writer i'm a freelance copywriter and a language trainer you all you're doing all all of that and as you do that these stories percolate <coughs> they just work on your mind all the time it's like when are you not thinking of your story that would be better when am i not i'm i'm thinking of it all the time of all the characters of what they would say how how would they look and a uh, little you know and when you're eaves dropping you get lovely snatches of conversation of vocabulary of of the of the turn of phrase and you lock it away in your mind because you don't know when it may come handy and that's when you don't have your notebook to jot it down you know yeah right i often find myself i send a message to myself if ah, i've heard right. something yes, interesting yes. quickly any last question we can have yeah over here this gentleman uh so i just wanted to ask okay i just wanted to ask uh is there any writing tradition that you follow when you are writing a book and when you are starting writing do you have some quirky traditions that you you know start with then and then you begin your books then around twice and you know <laughs> do you do that <laughs> Even if I did, I'm not going to reveal it yes. now. <laughs> Some kind of OCD thing that. Yeah. Or drink pots of coffee first, you know, just stuff. Yeah. Nah. You have Arifa. Not really. I think you I... probably keep a cobra next to you. <laughs> In my purse, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll show you some What? drinks. 
Yeah, not really. Nothing. You're just really trying to write and hide away from the family who will be hell bent on disturbing you. You know, yeah. usually, usually it's like that. Yeah. You know, women write every anywhere. Women writers very rarely have the luxury of having a separate study. Down the ages, my great grandmother was a writer in Bengal, and she used to go crawl into a cupboard and she used to write at night. Yeah. So maybe yes, you know, yes, all of us yes. we have to do that. So, I think that's, you know, it's been lovely talking to both in of you. In spite of the rain, in spite, in spite of, of the rain. No, yeah, the audience a, has been lovely. Thank you for coming. Lovely <laughs> audience and good questions. And thank you so much, Arifa. Look thank forward you. to your next book. Thank you thank very you much, Fulbul. Book. Only you. one thing I would like to say, because since the, I again remember another share, as I said, I uh, derive a lot from Urdu poetry. So since this is so much about the different shades of India. Um, uh, the Sher, uh, Sagar Khayami's Sher, Kuch aisi shay milai hai nafrat ke tel mein, Kuch aisi shay milai hai nafrat ke tel mein, Insaan ishq karne lage wholesale mein. Thank you.